And I will say there might be a prize for the person that provides the best definition. Anybody? Neural plasticity. Yes, please. Give it a shot. So she just gave the precise definition of neural plasticity. That was absolutely <laughs> astounding. You just got a prize. You just got a prize. You got a brain. Congratulations, you deserve it. Who doesn't need an extra brain? I need an extra brain. <laughs> we all do. Uh, that was absolutely perfect. That was amazing. We did not plant her there, I promise. So let's review some different definitions. So neuroplasticity, it's the brain's ability to respond to intrinsic and extrinsic stimuli by reorganizing itself through the formation of new neural connections. Now that's a mouthful. It's a lot of kind of fancy jargon. So let's provide it another way of looking at it. It's also the brain's ability to change its structure, function, and connections. Just let that sink in, that's astounding. It's also referred to as brain plasticity. You might hear it called cortical plasticity. You might also hear it called cortical remapping. They're all talking about the exact same thing. So Colleen and I have worked together for quite a while upstairs on inpatient, and we have kind of um, attached ourselves to the definition, it is your brain's ability to rewire or reorganize itself. We just find that to be nice and concise and effective, and for our patients, that's kind of easier to grab onto, but they're all saying the same thing in different ways. So it is your brain's ability to rewire or reorganize itself. That is truly amazing, and that is truly empowering for our patients in particular. For all of us in this room, as well as for our patients, it maybe had uh, a little bit of damage to their brain. And the exciting thing is, it's happening right now to every single one of you sitting in those seats as you're taking in this new information. <clears throat> so consider this, the brain is able to rebuild connections around the areas that have been damaged. So we just gave the example of someone that perhaps has a little bit of brain damage, let's say individuals that maybe had a stroke and maybe there is part of their brain that has a bit of damage. Well the amazing thing is that our brain has the capacity to reroute itself as well as strengthening the existing pathways for them to do the job of the part of the brain that was damaged. That will be unheard of 20 years ago. If any one of us said that 20 years ago, they would be throwing us out of the room. It's now 30, 30 years, years ago. ago. We've been doing this field for a while, but it's now 30 <laughs> years ago. That, that's amazing. So we put a little picture in here for you just to give a visual representation. So take a glance at that picture, and you can clearly see that there is a path there, correct? So the question is, how did that path get there? Well, at one point, Somebody who was a little bit lazy, could have been me, decided to not follow the designated path and took a shortcut, right? Now that one person traveling that one time did not establish that path. Can we all agree on that? Okay, we can all probably agree that it took many, many, many repetitions, probably many people walking down that path for it to truly get that distinct. Fair, fair statement? Okay, now let's just do an experiment here. What if we change the environment? What if we took that bench that you see there, if we took that bench and we actually blocked off that path, what do you suppose would happen? Exactly, you guys are amazing. Exactly <laughs> right, exactly right. So that path, most likely, nobody's gonna walk on that path anymore, except for a few, you know, little nutty people like myself might try to jump over it. For the most part, the path is gonna overgrow again with grass. We're gonna lose that pathway. However, a new pathway most likely is gonna sprout up off to the side on the other side of the bench. Is it gonna sprout up immediately? Absolutely not. Once again, it's gonna take time, it's gonna take repetition. This exact same process is what is happening in our brains. For example, when we're trying to learn a new task, or we suddenly stop doing the task. Okay, that speaks to the pruning of neurons and the developing of neurons and new neural pathways. Okay, so we'd like to provide a brief little video here that essentially illustrates this exact point. And the lady has a nice accent as well. The next thing that's going to get pulled up, I'll just start talking about them, are the 10 fundamentals of rewiring your brain, which are from Michael Mazinich. I always pronounce his name wrong, so I practiced beforehand. There are a lot of words, and some of them are convoluted, but they're really, really important, so we want to make sure that we hit upon them. So the first one is that change is mostly limited to those situations in which the brain is in the mood for. The pump has to be primed for change. 
if something's not meaningful or salient to you, we're not likely going to have that change occur. The harder you try, the more you're motivated, the more alert you are, and the better or worse the potential outcome, the bigger the brain change. Sometimes with our patients, we do things that might have a consequence associated with them, not like a punishment, but trying to do a wall push-up with your hemiparetic hand. Well, your brain's paying attention because if your hand misses, you could hit the wall. We wouldn't let that happen, but it's good for the brain to be paying attention. So what actually happens in the brain are the strengths of the connections of neurons that are engaged together moment by moment. So when Matt was talking about some brain facts, there were some little crazy video playing, and those were those neural connections. So learning-driven changes and in connections increases cell-to-cell -cell cooperation, which is crucial for increasing reliability. So in that lovely video we just saw, when we're doing those patterns together, that learning is going to be associated with that. That's going to help with the change. So the brain also strengthens its connection between teams of neurons representing separate moments of success of things that reliably occur in serial time. Again, pattern building, strengthening connections, establishing a path behind a bench, and getting rid of all the grass. So initial changes are temporary. If we don't eat the whole pint of ice cream in one night, it's not a lifetime change, but if I don't do that for multiple weeks, I've established a new pathway. So it's making things into lifestyle changes, lifestyle modifications that are really going to drive that change. So your brain is changed by internal mental rehearsal in the same ways and involving precisely the same process that controls changes achieved through interactions with the external world. This isn't really jazzy when you think about it. Functional MRIs have shown that when people just practice mentally a task, so say you're recovering from a brain injury and your therapist asks you to spend five minutes in a quiet space, just thinking about walking. That actually lights up areas of your brain that you use to walk. So just that mental rehearsal can help with establishing those pathways. Our memory guides and controls most learning. Every movement of learning provides a moment of opportunity for the brain to stabilize and reduce the disruptive powers of potentially interfering backgrounds or noise, focusing your attention onto that new task, that new lifestyle, that new pattern of exercising 30 minutes a day. And brain plasticity is a two-way street. This is probably the most important one to think about. It's just as easy to generate a negative change as it is to generate a positive one. When we're talking about neuroplasticity, we're always so excited about it, but there is the potential to have negative neuroplasticity. Those bad habits that get strengthened over time, the more and more that they're completed because that becomes the route that our brain takes the most. And I might just add a classic example of negative plasticity that you're hearing a lot about in the news now is addiction. It's a kind of a classic example of negative neuroplasticity. So we should have forewarned you that we're actually big fans of quizzes, so we're about to start another quiz. But now that you guys are experts in the area of neuroplasticity, we can now refer to you guys as neuroplasticianers. So congratulations to all of you for that accomplishment. Now let's start off with a little bit of a quiz. So what amount of practice contributes to changes to function and neural organization? What do you think? We're looking for a number. I heard nine, I heard 20, shout them out. Thousand. Ah. Someone's been studying. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So it's thousands, it's thousands upon thousands of repetitions of an activity that are actually required. And when you think about this, just consider the practice that's involved with learning any new task. Perhaps when you're learning a piano, for example, learning a new sport, you want to take it to the next level 
considered the practice that was involved. How much practice did Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, Simone Biles, Rachmaninoff have to undergo to become as good as they were in their given areas, right? Thousands and thousands and thousands. And if any one of them were suddenly to stop that for a prolonged period of time, guess what? They're not going to be quite as good, right? Another key point that we want to emphasize is that it's a process. This is not one single event, okay? This is an ongoing process. So fact or fiction, there is nothing you can do to help reduce some risks to your brain. Fiction, fiction. otherwise, what are we talking about? So unfortunately, there's no magic pill or guarantee that you won't have brain issues. We also, if there was that, wouldn't be talking about this right now because there'd be a magic pill. But there are many lifestyle choices, being physically active, staying social, which can help reduce some risks to your brain. Okay, fact or fiction, all short-term memory lapses are an early sign of brain decline. What do you guys think? Well, we certainly hope so, right? Let's check, I'm not sure. All right, as we age, some changes in brain functioning, including short-term memory, do happen more frequently than when you're younger. It's a part of life. And you can consider those times that maybe you have a thousand things on your mind, or maybe you're a little bit um, overstressed, maybe you haven't had a good night's sleep, right? You can remember those moments where perhaps you're not thinking quite as sharply. So if you do happen to notice and you have lapses in memory and it's on a regular kind of an ongoing basis, well, that's a time that it makes sense to check in with your doctor which isn't necessarily an admission that you do have a cognitive impairment. It's just a way for your doctor to kind of keep track, establish a baseline, and that way they can um, look into it. It might be something as simple as a medication change. It might be something as simple as managing stress, managing sleep. Creativity and wisdom do not automatically decline over time. Absolutely a fact. So a person's creativity, wisdom, and personality can remain constant their entire lives. How many people always say we become wiser with age? Get wisdom from your elders. Okay, fact or fiction, the things you do for heart health can help reduce some risks to your brain. What do you think? Absolutely. In fact, the heart healthy diet that no doubt you are all already following can help reduce some risks to the brain. A tip, you want to follow a heart-healthy diet and exercise regularly. It could be good for your brain. Another way to think of it is, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. You can almost think of it like plumbing, right? You're going to keep all those vessels wide open. Mental health issues such as depression are not an inevitable part of aging. In fact, the prevalence of mental disorders among older adults is less than all other age groups. If you wanna stay involved with social activities as you age, it can stave off loneliness as well as give your brain a workout. Um, a lot of people who report being happier and more engaged are people who still maintain a really um, vibrant social network. Okay, we just have 20 more questions. <laughs> so. Fact or fiction, crosswords and Sudoku puzzles could help prevent Alzheimer's disease. Fiction, fiction, fiction. fiction. I feel like that bears repeating because it's the, uh, the brain game business right now is indeed a business, it's a billion dollar business. Um, so let's speak to that point. It's almost always a good idea to challenge your brain to help overall brain health. However, scientists cannot prove that a particular kind of activity like Sudoku, like crosswords, like word searches, will actually prevent a specific disease. If you want to get the most bang for your buck, engage your brain by reading, doing social activities, or learning new skills. Pick up an instrument, learn a new language. So this is not that jazzy or exciting of a slide, but I think it's why we all came here. So aging is associated with, with the risk for dementia. It's associated with a decrease in cognitive function. It's associated with <clears throat> a decrease in dependence and quality of life. But it's an inevitable process. 
So we know that you guys want to know what can you do to help reduce your risk for those things to happen. And we're going to give you the answers to our final quiz up front. So we took this lovely analogy from Deepak Chopra and Rudy Tanzi. They're the authors of Super Brain, Super Genes, lots of stuff. And they have brain health kind of broken down to this lovely acronym of SHIELD. Sleep, handle stress, interact, exercise, learn, diet. So recommended for adults to be getting about eight hours of sleep, maybe more in evening. You wanna be able to handle your stress using techniques like medication, yoga, exercise, whatever helps you manage your stress. Interact with others for social stimulation. Exercise. We're a rehab hospital. We really, really like this one. Thinking about greater than 8,000 steps a day, 30 minutes of activity a day, 150 minutes of activity a week. There's many ways that you could break it down and look at it. Learning. Lifelong learning is amazing. It helps drive those neuroplastic changes, learning a language, learning to cook, learning to dance, things that are lighting up all sorts of areas of your brain. And for diet, most research has been done highlighting a Mediterranean diet, a vegetarian diet. Again, what's good for your heart, good for your brain. This is pretty much the exact same thing in a different slide. Uh, we just want to have you guys look at things that you want to avoid. Social isolation, poor nutrition, poor sleep hygiene, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, excess alcohol, learned disuse, chronic stress. So we want to promote interaction, nutrition, sleep, exercise, mental stimulation, and intellectual challenges. What is learned disuse? When you stop doing something. So I used to have to parallel park a pickup truck on Com Ave or Washington Street every single day, and I was fantastic at it. I cannot parallel park my Subaru Forester, which is much smaller, on Falmouth Main Street in a spot like this big now, because I don't do it every day. So that pathway is being pruned off. I think if I tried a lot and people weren't watching me or honking, I might be able to do it. But it's a skill that I didn't continue to use, and so it's not one that I can rely on now. Very good question. I like it. What's that? That's a perfect segue into the next couple of slides. Yep. I, so sorry, yeah, so she was asking how do you get back into tapping into using your brain? So that was a perfect segue in kind of the next series of slides now. So, Essentially, the answer is that previous slide, which is the shield slide. Now we're going to dig into kind of the details of that. So the first letter is S for sleep, right? So let's talk a little bit about sleep and some of the impacts that has. So sleep, we should also mention that some of these slides were updated. So if you're trying to follow through with the slides, it might be more distracting if you do that. Uh, if you want kind of a current, a newer copy, we can, um, we'll we can get, get that for you later on as well. And we also have many handouts for you, so I think you might already have most of them now. So sleep and brain health. Sleep affects almost every single type of tissue and system in the body. That includes the heart, the lungs, the brain, metabolism, the immune system, mood, disease resistance. Chronic lack of sleep increases the risk for high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, depression, and obesity. And listen to this one. Sleep actually plays a key role in removing toxins that build up in your brain throughout the course of the day. So by not sleeping, we're actually shrinking the amount of time that our brain needs to do its job of releasing those toxins. Without sleep, you can't form or maintain the pathways in your brain that let you learn and create new memories. And as we all know, it's much harder to concentrate and to respond quickly. A lack of sleep can cut learning ability by 40%. Get a full night of sleep within 24 hours after learning to strengthen new memories 
and build connections between different pieces of information. So if we're feeling like we're forgetful and we're having a hard time remembering something, well, if you didn't have a good night sleep the night before, didn't have a good night sleep the night after, it's going to be really hard to remember anything in between. Get enough sleep every night. So we've all heard about you know, the idea of eight hours. So the research still supports about eight hours for adults. For children, it's more like 10 hours. Memories will not be strengthened with four hours or less of nighttime sleep. So how do we get better sleep? Okay, so some of these may be apparent. You want to go to bed and wake up at the same time each day. So it's about establishing a routine. And you're gonna like establishing a routine is really key for the vast majority of these concepts, like exercise and things like that. You want to sleep in a dark, quiet, comfortable environment. You do not want to watch TV or have a computer in your bedroom. I should heed my own advice. I have I have a TV in my bedroom, I love it. If it wasn't there, I'd be going to sleep two hours earlier every night, guaranteed. I get home, I get cozy in bed, put on the news, the next thing Stephen Colbert is on, next thing you know, I am exhausted. So it's not a good plan. Exercise daily. A caveat to this is not right before bed because exercise is a stimulant. We definitely want you to do it, but just be mindful of not to do it too soon before bed. You want to limit the use of electronics before bed. So when you slide into bed, that's not the time to be breaking out the iPad and to be looking through your phone. Relax before bedtime. So what does that mean? For some people, it might mean taking a warm bath or a warm shower. For other people, it might mean just kind of tearing into one of your favorite books. You want to avoid alcohol and stimulants, such as caffeine, late in the day. And you want to see a doctor if you're having persistent problems sleeping. It could be something like sleep apnea. It could be a whole bunch of host of things that actually could be treated. So stress, the H of shield, handle stress. So this is not to say that all stress is bad stress. Some stress is good, it motivates you. We're talking about that chronic stress. So stress can create free radicals that kill brain cells. How many people in here have heard of the brain chemical cortisol? And then we all say cortisol is bad, we don't want it. So this is that kind of toxicity that it can create in your brain. Chronic stress can make you forgetful, emotional, have vicious cycles of fear and anxiety, causing more stress. It actually halts the production of new brain cells. Stress depletes critical brain chemicals, which can cause depression, and it puts you at greater risk for mental illnesses of all kinds. This first thing, chronic stress shrinks your brain. If we think back to those 10 fundamentals, we want to have a really big brain. We want a lot of neural networks. We want all those interconnected neural pathways. We want our synapses talking, and chronic stress is going to shrink those away. Stress lets toxins into your brain. It increases your risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease and it can contribute to brain inflammation and depression. If you look at the lovely picture, it is not something that we drew. No, I don't even know if I could draw that well. Squiggled lines. This is actually a colored slide from a functional MRI that shows what your brain looks like without chronic stress and with chronic stress. Which one looks better? There's some nice pathways there. I just, I, I'm going to chime in just because the slide is so important. Just take a second. Chronic stress shrinks your brain. It literally shrinks your brain. That is frightening. More specifically, it shrinks a very specific part of your brain referred to as the hippocampus. Why is that important? Well, number one, it's great for Jeopardy, Scrabble, so just log that back there for that. But in addition to that, the hippocampus, its job is memory and learning. We do not want that to shrink. To Colleen's earlier point, we want to be building up the neural volume throughout our brain. So here are some tips on managing your stress. First, you should probably recognize that you're chronically stressed. Maybe you have difficulty sleeping, increased alcohol or other substance use, you're easily angered, frustrated, continually have low energy. One thing that you can do Get some exercise. 
I think we've mentioned that a few times already. So just 30 minutes a day of walking could help boost your mood and reduce stress. And one thing I think Matt and I were talking about this yesterday when we were going through some of this is we don't need to think of exercise as exercise. Think of it as an activity, going for a walk, going out on the canoe, going out on the kayak, maybe doing a wellness program, trying something you haven't done before. Try a relaxing activity, maybe meditation, yoga, tai chi, gentle exercise. Set goals and priorities so that you can help establish that lifestyle modification. Stay connected with friends, family that can provide emotional and other support, and ask for help if you need it. And again, always, if you're having trouble managing this, talk with your doctor or healthcare provider. Oh yeah, so. so chemically, what's going on when you have rest and relaxation? So it actually helps with all these lovely things. All these lovely things are associated with improved health, whether that be for your brain, your cardiovascular system, but they're gonna help you improve digestion, reduce that cortisol in your brain, improve concentration and mood, improve your sleep quality, which we just learned is really important, and lower your fatigue. Stay connected. So this, in that acronym, we'll keep going back to that acronym SHIELD, so um, you walk hard here and you will definitely remember it, because we're gonna be repeating it so many times. So the I in SHIELD is that interact, right? So stay connected, interact, socialize. The research is clearly, it is clearly demonstrated that socializing is extraordinarily important and beneficial. And yet at the same time, it seems to be undervalued in, in how important it really is. Social activities are linked to reduce risk for some health problems, including dementia. People who have meaningful activities, people who engage in meaningful activities, such as volunteering, say they feel happier and healthier. Now, just a side note, we are so incredibly fortunate as Baldwin Cape Cod, we have an amazing collection of, uh, an amazing team, I should say, of volunteers here. And they do the most amazing work, which so positively and powerfully impacts our patients, our staff, and the whole of Spalding Cape Cod. And so we feel so incredibly fortunate, and yet, guess what, it's the volunteers that come to us that say that they're the ones who are so appreciative of the experience. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Truly, so that speaks to this point, right? And we have pretty strong anecdotal evidence from our volunteers right here. Could we, the volunteers, are there any of our Spalding Cape Cod volunteers in here right now? We just wanna give you guys a shout out. You guys are amazing. So thank you so much. We want to join in social and other programs through your area agency on aging, senior center, library, your local churches, any and all of those activities. I just want to add for a moment, just, just consider for a second what's involved with socialization. What do you guys think of when you think of socialization? People. So actually, that's, that's kind of the key. So why is that so important? Why is socialization so important with respect to your brain health? Well, it's so important because think of all the things that go on when you're socializing. So you're engaged with a person, okay? So let's say it's a reading group, let's say it's a cooking group, let's say whatever that social socialization activity you choose, but there's always gonna be a person, usually multiple people there involved, right? Now what's involved with communication? Well, if I'm communicating with someone, I'm actually looking at them, I'm listening to them, I'm actually interpreting their social cues, I'm interpreting their facial expressions, I'm interpreting their body language, right? Now hopefully, most social activities, let's hope there's some food involved. <laughs> that makes for a good social activity. So now our olfactory system is involved, our taste buds are involved, okay? So we're getting layer upon layer of activity. Maybe there's a little music in the background, maybe there's some conversations going on that you actually don't wanna tune into, so now you have to block that out. That's a very high level of processing. If you engage in a conversation with three or four people while blocking out another conversation 20 feet away. That's extremely challenging and that is very challenging for the brain. So point being, your entire brain is lit up during a social activity. So I just want to really sink that point home with why that's such an important activity. And it's so important because 
I know I have family members and friends who, as they age, what starts to happen? Well, hearing becomes a challenge, right? And so maybe the hearing's a challenge. I can't actually hear what's being said, so uh, I don't know what I really want to go and that's exactly right. That is exactly right. They isolate themselves, right? So hearing impairment, it's a little bit embarrassing. They can't hear the whole conversation. Why would I subject myself to that? Maybe there's a visual impairment. You know, it's hard for me to see, especially at nighttime. Maybe there's cataracts, glaucoma, other issues going on. You know what? I have aches and pains. It's hard for me to get there. We can come up with 100 reasons why we can't go there. But we should come up with 1,000 reasons why we should go there. And that's really the point we want to drive home. Right? As opposed to staying at home, sitting in a recliner, watching your TV, which is not giving you that stimulation. In fact, it's giving you just the opposite. It adversely affects your attention. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> so we're going to get to the E of shield. Exercise. We want you to get moving. Again, physical activity might prevent Reduce the risk of diabetes, heart disease, depression, stroke, cancers, falls, fractures, which can lead to some isolation. Can improve mental health and mood, improve sleep, reduce stress, and improve connections among brain cells. And again, we're going to keep drawing it back to neuroplasticity is improved with connections among brain cells, so we want that. So some recommendations. We want to get at least 150 minutes of exercise each week and again think of exercise as an activity it could be swimming dancing mowing the lawn golfing tai chi yoga it doesn't have to be lifting weights at the gym it doesn't have to be running on the treadmill you can join programs that can help you learn to move safely there might be some information about some wellness programs over there in that hallway um, that are available here at Spalding and again, you want to check with your healthcare provider if you haven't been active in a while and want to start a vigorous exercise program to make sure that it is healthy for you and that you're able to participate. So let's just reinforce the impact of physical exercise on cognition. Take a look at the column to the left. We have age-related cognitive changes can be caused by inflammation, neurovascular decline, changes to the central nervous system, and chronic stress. Slide your eyes over to the right. Good news, everyone. Exercise can reduce inflammation, neurovascular decline, changes to the central nervous system, and stress. Now, none of us in this room needs to be a mathematician to appreciate the benefit of exercise with respect to cognition. So one thing I think is really important with that Start ridiculously small. Set yourself up to be successful in adding something new into your daily routine. If we try to start here, we might get frustrated, disappointed, be not successful, and then we're not going to follow through with it. Lifestyle modifications are better and more carryover when you start small and build upon that you're kind of making that new pathway. And if we think back to that lovely video with the beautiful Australian accent, just keep running through that pathway and it's gonna build and build until that's the, your brain's default. That's just what you do. So if we get back to SHIELD, this is the L of SHIELD learning. You wanna keep your mind active. Do mentally stimulating activities, read a book, magazine, play games, learn new things, take or teach a class. Again, coming back to be social, true work or volunteering. And again, clinical trials have not proven that these type of activities prevent Alzheimer's, but they can be fun. Think about experiences. If you want to learn Italian, you could go to Italy. Immerse yourself in that culture. Not always an option, but you're gonna have so many areas of your brain activated. Those pathways are gonna be interconnected and that's the, one of the 10 fundamentals of neuroplasticity to build those really, really strong neural networks. Just wanted to build upon that point, especially with respect to learning new things. 
I, I just want to suggest, please, please don't let fear of failure, trying something new, stop you from doing it. Embrace the opportunity to learn something new and know that, you know what, we're probably not going to be good at it when we first start, and that is perfectly okay. So grab a friend, grab a family member, somebody you really enjoy spending time with, and say, hey, guess what? We're going to go take a Spanish class together. But you know what? That's just the beginning. Make it part of the bigger goal. So you know what? I've always wanted to go to Spain. I've always wanted to go to Argentina. So here's the deal. We're going to take Spanish for six months with the goal of going to Argentina. We're going to hike Patagonia. And you know what? We're going to do some good hiking down there. We're going to practice our Spanish. On the way back, we're going to stop at Buenos Aires. Why are we stopping <laughs> at Buenos Aires? What better place to learn the tango? And while you're there, you can test out some of that fine cuisine. That might be a long-term goal. But <laughs> So as our population ages and dementia becomes an increasing burden, interventions to delay or reduce cognitive decline are needed. So if we have not driven this point home yet, most successful interventions target lifestyle changes. Interventions to increase cognitive activity may delay cognitive aging and reduce dementia risk. Again. I also hope we've driven home this point, a greater neural volume, so that nice big brain at baseline can delay the emergence of impact of cognitive decline in daily activities. So we want to have a really, really, really big starting point. Okay, so we are now on to the D, so that SHIELD acronym is D for diet. So we're talking about eating smart, a lot of this is going to look very, very familiar to you. We just know that it still holds true. So what do we want to avoid? Obviously, those saturated fats, those are the red meats, sugar, especially the high fructose corn syrup, salt, alcohol, drugs, smoking, um, all things you already know. What do we want to increase? Vegetables. The vast majority of us don't get anywhere near enough vegetables in our diet. Fruits, whole grains and legumes. Fish has those fantastic omega-3s in them olive oil, and once again, we spoke about the Mediterranean diet and the vegetarian diet. That's because the research keeps coming back to those two diets. And don't think that you have to fully subscribe to one diet, but just if you start to migrate in that general direction, that's great, that's perfect. A little less red meat, a little more fish, that's a beautiful first step. And then antioxidants, we wanna to try to jack up the amount of antioxidants we can actually consume in our body. We put down some of the more enticing ones on here, like green tea, <laughs> red wine, blueberries, and dark chocolate. But there are many. <laughs> Yay, chocolate. However, it needs to be dark chocolate. And the higher the percentage of dark chocolate, the more powerful effect it has. Look for like 85% or above. But I'm with you. Yay, chocolate. So let's dig in a little bit deeper. Let's talk about some superfoods. So a lot of these you probably have heard about. Um, I just want to throw a caveat out there. With respect to like fruits and vegetables, of course, we want to encourage that. There are certain ones that you probably read about this. We have dirty vegetables and dirty fruits. And what they mean by that are those fruits, the way that they're grown with the pesticides and the herbicides and the insecticides. You want to be really conscientious about getting really certain ones definitely organic. And we know that costs more, which is unfortunate, but look at it as an investment in your body and in your brain. Well worth it. So like, uh, for example, like spinach, strawberries, blueberries, those are kind of the classic dirty ones that you want to definitely get um, organic. So back to the, uh, the first top of the list here, we have purple, red, and blue grapes jam-packed with photochemicals, which are those antioxidants we're speaking of. Blueberries may help protect the cells from damage and lower inflammation, as well as strengthen the immune system, protect against cancer and heart disease. You guys can swing by, stop and shop on the way home and grab some blueberries. Those things are fantastic. Red berries, so especially the strawberries and the raspberries, those also contain these photochemicals that also protect against cancer-causing agents, specifically the ones in our diet and our environment. Nuts, nuts are one of the most balanced foods on the planet. So walnuts in particular are really good uh, in terms of containing uh, the omega-3s. Our dark green vegetables, we know those are jam-packed full of vitamin C, E, A, and calcium, again, loaded with uh, antioxidants and photochemicals. Sweet potatoes and orange vegetables. Tea, when talking about tea, like tea in general is great. Uh, green tea, if you want the most bang for your buck, go with the green tea. It has even more of those antioxidants. Whole grains, just making this one dietary change may significantly improve your health. 
So you want to be thinking whole grain bread, not the white bread. Be thinking wild or brown rice, not the white rice. Try corn tortillas instead of flour tortillas. So, so small little changes can actually add up, have that cumulative effect and make a big difference. Beans, jam-packed with antioxidants. Fish, so we all know fish, omega-3s. Uh, in terms, people often say, okay, great, any kind of fish? It's actually specific fish um, you want to be looking for. So the, the star, the starfish, not to say a starfish, but the starfish, like, hey, yeah, starfish. We're looking at sardines, salmon, mackerel, tuna steak, wild rainbow trout, shark steak, albacore tuna, and herring, just to give you an idea. Again, you guys have a list of this on you, so you don't have to remember that one. Okay, so we like to try something new. Funny story. When we first started doing this, we thought we were going to do some Tai Chi moves for all of you. And then Joy and a few others told us how many people we were expecting. Well, we said, you know what, maybe Tai Chi moves, given how many people here, maybe that's not going to be the best idea. As therapists, we don't want someone to fall. We don't want that on our record. It really doesn't look good. <laughs> so we decided to try something different. We'd like to try to do a three-minute meditation. Now, for some people not comfortable doing this, just you can you don't have to close your eyes if you don't want to, but just give it a try. It's only three minutes. All right? So allow yourself to tune out. So the research is amazing with respect to the power of meditation. That was just three minutes. Right? So we can all find three minutes in our day, five minutes in our day. You can do this when you're driving home from the grocery store. You can do this right before bed. You can do it when you first wake up. You can do this walking. You can do this lying. You can do this standing in place. You don't have to be formally trained to do this. You're just literally trying to just let all those thoughts escape for a few minutes. Give your, give your brain and your body a rest. All right, we are going to use one of the principles of neuroplasticity, repetition. And we are going to talk about your brain health again. So these should look familiar. This brainhealth.gov says that you should discover a new talent, drink moderately, eat up, get moving, get some shut eye, know your blood pressure, maintain your balance, mind your meds, stay connected, and talk to your doctor. Those things sound familiar? So what does AARP have to say? So they, they utilize the five pillars of brain health. The research is conclusive. Lifestyle behaviors can have a big impact on your brain health. Move, okay, that's our exercise one. Discover, that's our learning one. Relax, stress management. Nourish, nourish our bodies. That's speaking to that diet again. And connect, and once again, we're bringing it back to the socialization. We're just trying to show you all of these different sources that essentially are telling us the same thing. So the Cleveland Clinic has these six pillars of brain health. Physical activity, food and nutrition, medical health, sleep and relaxation, mental fitness, and social interaction. I think we are finding a very repetitive theme. Okay, let's travel over to the Harvard Medical School. What do they have to say? Get mental stimulation, get physical exercise, improve your diet, improve your blood pressure. Improve your blood sugar, improve your cholesterol. Consider a low dose aspirin in consultation with your doctor. Avoid tobacco, avoid or limit alcohol. Care for your emotions, protect your head, and build a social network. So, we told you we gave you the answers to the last quiz already. So, what does SHIELD stand for? There may be a prize involved with this. <laughs> Anybody? Sleep. Keep she going. got it. Help her out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we got sleep. Handling stress. Handling stress. Yeah, help from the audience is accepted. So we heard interact, we heard exercise. Diet. Diet. Learning and diet. Oh, we had a little misspelling there, but we got it. <laughs> All right, I think that, that warrants a brain. Well done, well done. <laughs> All right, let's just pull it all back together again, okay? Reinforcing the point. Sleep. We're looking at eight hours. Handle stress. Everybody handles it differently. 
Maybe it's meditation, maybe it's yoga, maybe it's exercise, maybe it's sitting on the beach at sunrise or sunset, whatever works for you. Interact with others for social stimulation. Exercise, let's call that activity, okay? 8,000 steps a day, or just think of it as 30 minutes of activity every day, and make it part of your routine. Learn new things to develop new synapses in your brain. Remember, you're going to Argentina, learn some Spanish, learn the tango. And then diet. I think we've highlighted the Mediterranean and vegetarian diet are consistently reinforced in the research. So what can you do today? Pick one thing that may help your brain and start ridiculously small. Try taking a 10 minute walk a few times a week and when that's your routine, build it up a little bit. Add one serving of vegetables a day. Make an appointment for health screenings or physical exam. But I really think the important thing is to start small so you can be successful. Also consider writing down what you do and when you plan to do it. Essentially, you're holding yourself accountable. And again, research suggests that if you write things down, you're more inclined to do it. Also take the next step. Get support from family and friends and community groups. They can also help hold you accountable, and you can even hold them accountable. There's nothing like a peer support group. And then stay active. Really, that's what this is all about, is just stay active, and remember that it's about a lifestyle change. And we just wanted to show you some neuroplasticity at work. Don't you know that it's worth every treasure on earth? To be young at heart For as rich as you are It's much better by far To be young at heart So we should probably fill you in on that, picture, that video a little bit. Both of those individuals who agreed to be videotaped um, are recovering from having strokes. I'm not sure if you're able to pick up on it because they're actually pretty smooth, but they both have significant impairments on one side of their body. And yet there they are, standing up, unsupported, without an assistive device, which they normally use, they're dancing. Do you think their brains are engaged? Do you think their bodies are engaged? And that's what it's all about. These are just some general resources. You guys, we have them on one of those lovely handouts. Just some books that are phenomenal. Again, going back to Deepak Chopra, who just led us through that lovely meditation, and Dr. Tanzi. Um, Marzinich, uh, Oliver Sacks. There's just, if you want to read more about the topic, there's, a, there's lots of choices. Uh, there's also some resources on the internet. Yeah, we, there's, there's a whole bunch of really good TED Talks. I'm not sure how many of you um, have checked out TED Talks. If you haven't, I strongly encourage you to. TED Talks are phenomenal. Um, so please check those out, the ones that we gave you, and then once you get on there, you're probably not going to want to get off. Um, so we'd like to end off with a quote from Aristotle. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence. Therefore, it's not an action, but a habit. And with that, we'll take any questions or even just comments.